Uh, we're recording here now, Brad, and I can cut off those little bits of test bit at the beginning before I publish this. Uh, I will post a copy of the recording of this session for everyone um, in case somebody misses it or somebody wants to uh, check out a part of it later on. So, Brad, uh, welcome. Excellent. And Rob, thanks so much for um, for having, having us get together tonight on, for this great cause. Um, for folks that don't know me, my name is Bradley Shepard. And I am a diversity and inclusion um, and equity trainer out of Sydney, Nova Scotia. I've spent um, 20 years in the Canadian Armed Forces. And as part of that, I've did a lot of training with multiple uh, community members. And I'm just really glad that, um, you know, Rob and I had a chance to connect um, and engage in this important work. And, you know, I, I especially want to thank folks for taking the time out uh, tonight and who registered and logged in today. Besides exploring some useful skills, Today's webinar was scheduled to help support Jesse's journey, um, the 2021 virtual walk to defeat the shame. Jesse's journey is a non-profit organization that helps to support research and the treatment and cure of Duchenne muscular dystrophy. In this session, we're going to look at some of the things that educators, whether in K to 12, um, higher education or workplace training environments, can do to make their digital resources more accessible. Now we're not talking about complicated coding or using high-end technologies today. We're simply gonna look at ways that we can make sure we're, make, we're meeting uh, the essential um, digital accessibility standards using the tools that we all use in our jobs almost every day. Um, so that's a little bit about what we're gonna, why we're doing this important work. But what I'd like to do is take a minute and just introduce um, Dr. Rob Power. Rob is an assistant professor of education with Cape Breton University, past president of the International Association for Mobile Learning, and president of Powered Learning Solutions. With over two decades of experience in the educational sector, he specializes in institutional, sorry, instructional design for online and digital learning. He also integrates this into the technology that he uses. So without further ado, Rob, I think I'll hand it over to you so you can teach us a couple things this evening. Thank you very much, Brad. Uh, and thank you for that introduction. I guess I don't need to provide too many more details. And I do see some names in the uh, the participant list here tonight of, uh, of uh, people who I recognize. So, uh, so there's a lot of people here who I've encountered before. So I don't think I need to spend too much more time doing an introduction. And we could dive right into some of those materials. But before I do, before I dive into any of the content for this evening, I would like to do just a quick land acknowledgement. So uh, Bradley and I are here in Sydney, Nova Scotia right now. And I'd like to acknowledge that uh, both Power Learning Solutions and Shepherd Diversity Training recognize that here in Cape Breton Island, uh, the island is in Mi'kmaq, which is the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. And this territory is covered by the Treaties of Peace and Friendship, which the uh, Mi'kmaq and Maliseet people first signed with the British Crown in 1725. Those treaties did not deal with surrender of lands and resources, but in fact recognized the Mi'kmaq and Maliseet title and established the rules for what was to be an ongoing relationship between nations. So uh, I also recognize that uh, some of you are coming from other jurisdictions. So we have many different lands uh, that are covered by our participants here this evening. But uh, I just uh, I do like to take the time to offer that acknowledgement at the beginning of any uh, sessions that I host. So thank you for allowing me to do that. So as Brad has uh, mentioned already, uh, we are doing this webinar this evening in support of Jesse's Journey. Uh, Jesse's Journey is a Canadian organization that funds research uh, to help with uh, finding treatments and cures for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And uh, my wife and I have become increasingly involved with that organization over the past uh, couple of years. And as a matter of fact, once I'm done with this session here this evening, I'm going to be running downstairs. My wife's already going to be logged into a webinar hosted by Jesse's Journey. They're going to be announcing the recipients of the research grant funds that uh, they're giving out this year uh, towards uh, some of these uh, treatments and uh, hopefully one day a cure for Duchenne. And I'd like to, uh, besides acknowledging Jesse's Journey, 
who were doing this valuable work for, I would like to uh, acknowledge uh, Brad and Shepherd Diversity Training. Hopefully this is not the last you're going to hear of a partnership between the two of uh, our organizations and our fight to, uh, to support diversity and, uh, and accessibility for all learners. I'd also like to start off before diving into any of the contents by just giving you a little bit uh, of a background on my perspective on this, how, how I'm approaching the, uh, the content that I'm going to be looking at here tonight, and how I approach this topic in general. Uh, Brad introduced me as a, sort of an academic expert and a, and a technology expert, but I'd, I'd just like to, to let everyone know it. I come at this first as a parent, uh, and I have three children two of whom have recognized disabilities, have been diagnosed with different disabilities. So I'm coming at this first as a parent. Then I'm coming at this uh, from the perspective of a teacher. I've got uh, over two decades of experience in the education sector now. I currently work with uh, those who are training to become teachers in bachelors of education programs, as well as candidates in masters of education programs. I'm also supervising some candidates for doctors of education programs. So I come at this from an educator's perspective, uh, from a perspective of what's pragmatic and what works for everybody in their day-to-day -day working environments, more so than from a theoretical perspective. And lastly, I come at this from the perspective of a professional instructional designer. And I've been working in that area now since, I would say, formally since 2012, 2013. I've had formal titles as an instructional developer or an instructional designer and working to help people build educational resources. So what are we going to have a look at here today? We are going to be taking a look at some of the types of tools that we use every single day. It doesn't matter what, uh, what sector you're in as a trainer or an educator, or even if you're not into training, if you're producing documents that are going to be consumed by public audiences, we're going to look at some common things that we use every day. Things like documents, uh, we all use images all the time when we're producing documents or web-based content. We all work with color in our documents and our presentations and resources that we create. And I'm also going to take a look at uh, the, uh, the concept of adding closed captions to videos or finding video resources that have closed captions available and why that's important. So these are things that don't really require any special coding on our parts, but it requires that we are aware of them so that we can address them when we're creating our resources. And I'll show you how easy it is to actually address those things and make sure that, uh, that you've got these things covered for your students. And one final thing uh, that I'd like to take a, to, a moment to show you here before I dive into this. And this gets to the heart of why I think it's important that we address these things that I'm going to look at. This is a uh, cartoon that I found a few years ago, and I absolutely love this one. I think it speaks volumes. The, uh, the gentleman in this photo is shoveling off the steps. Uh, I guess from his perspective, there are more students who would be using the steps than the ramp. So he's shoveling off the steps first, and uh, the little fellow in the wheelchair is asking him if he could shovel the ramp. And he says he'll get to it in a moment once he uh, gets the steps for everyone else. And as the, uh, the little fella in the wheelchair points out, if you get the ramp for me, everyone can use the ramp and access. Everyone can get in. And I think the same applies to when we address digital accessibility uh, within our courses, within the materials that we produce. Addressing it doesn't stand in the way of addressing the needs of anyone else who doesn't have a recognized disability or doesn't uh, doesn't use special technologies to access our resources. It in fact enhances it for everybody and removes that barrier that uh, would otherwise be there for some of our audiences. So it's important to keep this stuff in mind. It's important to address it because we are creating barriers if, if we don't address it. And Depending on the jurisdiction that you live in in Canada right now, there's no formal legislation here in Nova Scotia at the moment. Uh, I've sat on some uh, working group meetings and some uh, some traveling committee meetings. They're they're working on some policies, working towards some legislation in Nova Scotia with regards to built environment and educational um, educational resources. 
uh, with respect to, to accessibility. If you're in Ontario, AODA has been in place since 2005, I believe. In British Columbia, the uh, digital accessibility regulations there should be coming into force, I believe, in 2022. Manitoba has just come into force this year. And as a matter of fact, as of yesterday, more elements of Manitoba's accessibility legislation came into force as of May 1st. Um, Alberta, I believe, has some uh, some regulations that are in force already. And there's even talk of uh, of creating federal level basic accessibility standards that would also address digital accessibility. So even if you're not so concerned about addressing the access for your students, there's always that legal aspect, the regulatory aspect of it as well. And it's so much easier for us to address these things when we're creating documents now than it is to discover that all of a sudden we have a student who has a particular need and we have to go back and check every single document we've been building up for years and years and fix them all. If you start making stuff right the first way, uh, the first time around, you don't have to worry about it. All right, so uh, one other thing I'd like to point out about addressing these things now. I like to tell my teacher candidates to stop thinking about it so much as redressing accessibility issues and to start thinking about it more as simply providing a, a greater menu of options for everybody. And those options just so happen to be ones that are barrier free and everyone can benefit from them. So uh, stop thinking about it as, uh, as trying to fix a problem. Think about it as just expanding what we're doing for everybody. All right, so we're going to take a look at uh, working with documents. One of the big things that we're going to take a look at in there is the idea of our heading structures. Um, we have to make sure that we properly format our headings, that we actually tag them as headings when we're creating the documents. I'll bring you through some examples of that shortly. Uh, you don't want to be manually creating pretty looking headings for your document. Be the, the reason being that if you don't, if you do that, if you don't tag your document with the proper structure, then it's actually going to cause some accessibility barriers. It's going to make it more difficult for users to navigate your document. And the tools that we can use to do this are the exact same tools that are already built into word processors that will allow you to automatically generate a table of contents. They also work for digital accessibility. We're going to take a look at using images, uh, why it's important not to embed text within an image, uh, why it's uh, important to, to make a note when we embed an image if it's simply decorative or if it contains important content, and how to make sure that important content, non-decorative content, can be recognized by our visually impaired users by adding alt text to those images. We're going to take a look at the importance of color and the idea of having a good strong color contrast ratio as opposed to using bad uh, color contrasts, ones that make it more difficult to read the text against the background. Obviously, as you can see from the little image that I have embedded there, the uh, the more the stronger the contrast is between the, the color of the text and the color of the background, the easier it is for everybody to read. And we're going to take a look at uh, closed captions, adding captions to videos, why these are important. This is not just for the visually impaired user. A lot of our students now like to watch videos with the captions on so that they can read what's happening because they just might be in a noisy environment when they're watching our instructional videos. Or it might be rude or inappropriate for them to turn the volume up because they might be disturbing others. Uh, so it helps everybody to have closed captions there. We just want to make sure that when we find videos that they have captions enabled. And if we're not adding the captions ourselves, you want to watch that entire video first before you give it to your students to watch and make sure that the captions actually match the words because when we automatically uh, add captions, when you let YouTube automatically add, add the captions, there can be some, sometimes they're hilarious, the errors matching the words, other times they can actually be downright offensive. So we want to watch for that. All right, so I'm going to jump right into a little bit of a how-to demonstration right now. So Bradley, um, 
if you want to uh, take the reins for a moment to see if anybody has any questions or if uh, you have any questions that you wanted to ask. And I am going to start uh, sharing my screen while you're doing that so that I can walk you through a few things. Sure, Rob. I think the first thing I'd like to ask is, is there any questions out there? Because I, I know I have one. So if there's no questions, Rob, one of the things that's boiling my mind is um, how how someone would go about making um, like text documents or Word documents more accessible for, for our learners. Thanks, Brad. That is actually a good place to start because it's probably the one that we'd use most commonly. So I'm going to bring everyone here on my screen into the Canvas space that I've set up for this webinar. And you'll notice if you've had a chance to do a little bit of touring around in here that under the modules area, or if you click on resources at the bottom, I've already populated some contents in here and I've organized them. And one of the things that I've added is some examples of working with text. This first one I'm going to show you is an example of a text document that is completely inaccessible. This is one that I got. Uh, as part of a readings package in a course I took way back in 2011, so a decade ago. And I'm sure that a lot of us have done this as teachers over the years, more so going into the classroom if we're going to hand it out on paper. We quickly run, we photocopy a chapter from a book and we give copies of it to our students or we give them a few pages because we want them to read it in class. In this case, this is a photocopy from a book that was then turned into a PDF and was provided as a reading in a course that I was taking. Um, the reason why this is a bad example, if you can see here with my mouse, I can't highlight anything. That's a good test for you with any documents you're thinking of using. If you can't highlight any of the text, then it's not machine readable. This is not actually a text document that is saved as a PDF. It's a picture saved as a PDF, a photocopy. It's not machine readable, which means that not only can I not copy the text and paste it somewhere else, someone who's using Google Read and Write or who's using a digital screen reader application such as JAWS, for example, that, that application cannot read this document to them. It's simply a blank file. They, they can't read it at all. So. While it's easy for those of us who don't have vision issues to take this document and to print it off and to read it, it's not accessible at all to those of our users who have, uh, who have visual impairments. It's also not accessible to those of our users who may, be, who may have literacy issues and are not, uh, are not able to read the document on their own and might need to use that software to read it to them so that they could hear it spoken. Um, so that's why this would be a bad example. Here's another bad example, and I'm going to actually use this example here to work through uh, showing you how to fix some of these and answer that question that, uh, that Bradley had just asked. The reason why this one is a bad example is because it's, unfor it's not properly formatted. These are, uh, this is a copy of a paper that I wrote a few years back. It's a paper that I actually published in uh, Learning and Teaching in Higher Education Gulf Perspectives, but this was from a rough draft of it. And there's a lot of issues with this. This is manually formatted, this heading is, as is this. Um, this here, this again is text that's just an embedded image, this document is, uh, this table is. So it's not machine readable, completely inaccessible. And I've got a copy of this document here and I can show you how to address a few of these things. So you see this is coming up as normal text, as is that. Which means that while this is not, while this is machine readable text, it's not easy for someone with a visual impairment to navigate this document. If they were to open this up with Google Read and Write or JAWS, the application is going to read the entire document to them from start to finish and they're not going to be able to find the part that they want to read. Maybe they don't want to read the introduction. They read that yesterday. Maybe they want to pick up here on this section 
or on the on the next section. Maybe they want to skip ahead to the references to uh, to see the works that I cited when I wrote this. They can't easily do that. They have to get the machine to read the whole thing to them if you don't properly tag this. It's quite easy to fix. You simply type up your document, take what you have for your headings, and properly tag them using the styles up here on the toolbar. So you'll see that there's a title style. If it's not matching the formatting that you want, you can fix that. I can manually change my, uh, my font up here to whatever I want. I can change the size. I can right click on this formatting style and I can update it. And I can do the same here. I'll take this as heading level one. It's a primary level heading for my document. Take it as heading one. Oh, I don't like that size. I'll make it bigger. And I can update heading one to match. And now I'll go through and find all my appropriate headings throughout the document and tag them. So if I have any uh, that are already heading level one somewhere else in the document, it's going to pick that up and change the formatting of it for me. So this one here should also be a heading level one. So I'll change that. This one here should be a heading level two. So I'm going to change that to heading two and maybe I want to make that a little bit bigger. Again, I can update that. So your students could do this and update these styles here to match APA formatting or MLA formatting, for example. And make sure that everything is tagged throughout the document. And then I'll show you what benefit this is to those of us uh, who aren't using digital screen reader applications. This is what uh, these styles were originally intended for. I can go to my, uh, I believe it's under, not under layout, review, it's under one of these here for adding the table of content, references, there we go. Table of contents, so I want to add an automatic table of contents here, so there we go. Now it adds the table of contents for me, it picks up all of my headings, creates the table of contents, and it's one that I can actually click on part of this and go to that section. So I can click on examples here and it'll take me down to that heading. Well your digital screen readers can do the same thing. You can use your tab key on your keyboard and you can go from section to section to section and then let it read out that section to you. You don't have to read the entire document. Very easy to do. It only takes you a few extra seconds. Actually makes it easier for you to work with larger documents and it'll be a lifesaver for your students when they're reading through your instructional materials. This here, not exactly a good example, not something that I would do these days, uh, embedding a table as an image. Again, it's not machine readable. I can't copy paste this text. Everything that's in here can't be read by a visually impaired user or by somebody who's using a screen reader. So I would need to just go and rebuild this table and, uh, and properly format it and make sure that it, you can copy paste the text and then it's, uh, it's easily readable. I also want to make sure that I'm adding alt tags to my images as I'm adding them to this document. So this figure here, I can right click on it. There's an option to edit the alt text. And you want to make sure that you have some basic text in here that describes what's in the image. The reason you want to do that is because when you're using a digital screen reader application, just like you can navigate from heading to heading, when you hit an image, the screen reader is going to read the alternate text to you. Years ago, this was something that we used as web developers uh, for when we had slow download connections. You'd see the words, uh, the little triangle and the words appear on the screen until the image downloaded. Now we use it for as an accessibility tool. So make sure that you have that alt text there, or if the option is available, mark it as a decorative image. Don't do that if it's important content such as uh, this figure. This is instructional, uh, has instructional value. But if it's just a decorative image like a logo, then yeah, mark it as decorative. What's going to happen then is the screen reader will ignore it. For your visually impaired users, it will be as if it doesn't exist. It's not going to cause them any confusion. So mark as decorative if it is. If not, make sure you add the alt text in there. So let's assume that I, that I have added the alt text to this. Now I want to uh, publish this and share it with my students, but not as a Word document. Why? Maybe some of my students are using Google Docs. Maybe some of them are using Pages on a Mac. 
PDF is a much more universal uh, format for sharing documents. So I'm going to share this out as a PDF. I will save it as a PDF. So it's going to save this file for me. And now I'm going to remove that unformatted tag because I have done some formatting on here. And it will save this as a PDF for me. Just takes a moment. I am now happy that my Word document is fully accessible for my students, but I want to make sure that my, uh, my PDF is as well. And it's not always the case that everything translates over perfectly. The biggest thing that you need to look for in here, it's going to pick up your heading structures. That's good. You can, uh, my students will be able to navigate this based on the heading structure. The easy way to see that is to check, uh, I believe it's under the bookmarks here. Yeah, you can see it's got the headings built in to pick them up. So that's good. But it may not properly pick up the reading order for me. So it might read this table of contents first and then this up here and then skip down to something else. I just want to make sure it doesn't do that. If you're using the full Adobe suite, that's easy to do. You need to uh, just check the accessibility in your document. And it's one of the options that I have over here. Here we go, accessibility. And I can check my accessibility using this. And it's going to pick up some of the most common errors for me. So I'll just do a check. Start checking. And it's going to give me some of the key things here. So four issues. Accessibility permission flag. So these have all passed. Primary language failed. That's an easy one to fix. So fix. I just pick that. This will tell a screen reader application what language the document is in. Title has failed. Okay, I can fix that. I can add a title to it. And this will be bad example. That's fixed. Uh, color contrast needs to be manually checked. I'm going to say that it's fixed. And I will show you how to check color contrast lately, uh, shortly. So I think that most of this alternate text, there's one issue with the alt text. So figures with alt text have failed. Some of these I didn't fix uh, when I was uh, doing this example. So I can add the alt text to these now for my PDF before I manually pass this and tables. There's an issue with, uh, no, nope, there's no issue with the tables there. Regularity. So there's a couple of things in here. Yeah, it's picking up these tables, which are images. So it lets you fix all of those. If you're going to share something as a PDF, you have the full Adobe suite. By all means, it's worth doing. If not, make sure that you have checked everything in your Word document before you publish it out. And you should be good on most of those, uh, most of those elements. So those are the essentials you should keep in mind when working with documents. Do we have any other, um, any other issues we'd like to take a look at, Brad? I'm, I'm just blown away with all of the things that, um, you know, we never really see in our everyday use of use of word documents. Um, but there are some questions in the chat. So, um, I see Robin K has a question, Robin. Yeah, I have a few questions, Rob. Um, in terms of table formatting, uh, tables look natural to us. Do they read from left to right, top to bottom? Is there a way of doing that or is it just naturally pick up the, the table? They, or we might want it to read it down, I don't know. <laughs> um, it doesn't always naturally pick up your intended order with a table. I tell my students to avoid using tables as much as possible unless it's absolutely necessary, i.e. if they're presenting statistical figures in a paper they're writing. Otherwise, keep things linear to avoid the, uh, the nastiness of having to properly format the tables. Sometimes you can't avoid it, but if you're just presenting text and you want to arrange it using a table to make it look nice and neat, that's not, uh, to me, that's not a good enough reason to use a table. There's also some user interface con uh, considerations when working with tables, some user experience. 
Is there a screen reader that you would suggest that I could use? Because I think that actually might be quite valuable just to check my own document, see how someone um, who has trouble reading it, how it reads. Um, Google Read and Write is the first one that comes to mind. Okay. Uh, JAWS can be a, a little bit more expensive, and that's a dedicated one used by visually impaired users. It's functional for using with things like a digital switch for those who have limited physical mobility as well, but it can also work with a keyboard. But I'll tell you what I will do. I am going to go into the Canvas space under the discussions. There's a sharing resources section there, and I will post a link tomorrow. I'm working with uh, with Christine from the uh, from Dyslexia Canada. She's the uh, president of Dyslexia Canada, and I'm going to be doing a webinar with her in a couple of weeks on tools that adults who are living with dyslexia can use uh, to help them navigate documents and to help them uh, navigate their their daily lives. And one of the things we're going to be looking at is uh, some of the screen reader applications that are available for free or for reasonable price. And Christine's already got a list of those that Dyslexia Canada has already looked at on their website. So I will see if that is publicly available and I will share that link and then you'll have, it's basically straight from the horse's mouth, what are the good ones to use as opposed to, uh, to from me. Okay, uh, a couple more questions. So with the alt text, I noticed in that Venn diagram, for example, and you know how they say a picture's worth a thousand words and so, uh, you'd have to come up with a, um, I think a pretty meaningful and thoughtful description, wouldn't you, to be fair, because they can't just say, well, this is a Venn diagram of three things mm -hmm. and you know, because th that puts the person at a disadvantage, right? So you have to spend yeah, some yeah, time that. to think I, through. I understand exactly where you're coming from on that. And that, Robin, is a good segue for us to get into the next topic that I had here. I did have this page up, uh, by the way, for everyone's purpose, just to show you. I have some more resources here if you want to take a deeper dive into making your documents more accessible. But let's take a segue here at this point into, uh, and I have some more detailed tutorials here if you'd like to take a deeper dive into it and practice some stuff yourself. Let's take a look at making those images accessible. So I have some resources in here. I've got a video uh, if you want to take a deeper dive, but I'm going to give you an example here now of why it's bad to just embed text within an image. We've all heard that, uh, especially those of us who've done any uh, programs, uh, education sector programs, training programs in recent years, we've heard about how great infographics are for conveying information. The question I have to ask is, are they really? They're great for our non-visually impaired students. They're not so great for those who have vision issues. And this is a prime example. This is a uh, cheat sheet that I created. It's an infographic and it's got a lot of text in it. And I've just embedded it here into this page. Looks good for those of my students who don't have visual issues. Um, it is a bit blurry because the zoom is, uh, is uh, a bit too big on it on this, in this example. But if you're visually impaired, you can't access this. It's useless to you. And even if I've got a good alt tag on here that says this is uh, Rob's digital accessibility cheat sheet, it's not going to give you all these key points. So if you want to get around that and address that problem that Robin was talking about, I've got an example here on the next page. Again, I've embedded this cheat sheet. I do have an alt uh, tag in here. So if I edit this, I can show you my alt text. So I go to image options here. Here's my alt text. Digital accessibility cheat sheet, download accessible PDF copy with the link below. So at least even though with the screen reader, they can't read all the contents that are in this, it's telling them exactly where they can read all the contents in it. And there's a PDF version of this that can read everything to them. And I've checked it for reading order and all of that stuff. And I've tagged all these images on here as decorative in the PDF. So it's going to read out the key points to them and be fully accessible. And that link is here. But to take this a step further, and this is what I recommend to my education students, is that once you embed an image with key points in it and you've got your alt text in there, also explain it in paragraph form in the primary text. Oftentimes when you're looking at uh, a Word document like uh, the academic paper that I showed you, and I'll come down to this figure here where it's got the Venn diagram. Well, these paragraphs that are surrounding 
this actually explain what Colt's frame model is and what the importance of it is in this context. So this is just providing a visual sort of summary, trying to anchor things to help you visualize the key points I've talked about here. But the true explanation is in the paragraph. So I tell my students, uh, don't rely on the image alone to provide the information. Embed it in the text, embed uh, some meaningful alt text in this. So the image enhances, but lack of the image on the page does not detract. That's the whole point of a good image. A good image will enhance, but missing it won't detract from your content. So all of this content is here. There's a downloadable version available and there's an alt tag. And that's how I would address that uh, in this case. So hopefully, Robin, that answers the question that you had. Thanks, it does. And also when talking about working with images, um, you know, we need to look at color in our images. I'm going to go back here for one moment. You'll notice that my accessibility cheat sheet is rather bland in its color scheme, black and white with just a little bit of color here because it's important for the point that I'm making. Uh, I have some other examples of, of, uh, of infographics that I've created that have a blue background, uh, a dark blue background with bright white text. I try to keep things as monochromatic as possible uh, because color, if you're using color to convey your key points, those key points can then be lost on users who are colorblind or users who, who are uh, visually impaired and can't see the text at all. They can't see if I have this first sentence highlighted in yellow with the, with the highlighter tool. They can't see if I have the word colleague in bold. And they can't see uh, if I'm using different colors here for the fonts. So it's going to be meaningless to them. Also, I may have some examples of uh, text where the color does not have enough contrast with the background, like this here, this bad. You can see that this might be difficult to read if this were on a black and white screen. Or if I were to print this out and my ink was getting low on my printer. Or if I was colorblind, it might cause some issues. Another example of this, this is an email that I recently received and uh, I've blurred out the uh, institutional uh, icons here so that uh, I'm not calling attention to anyone in particular. This text up here is fine, white on the black background, fairly easy to read. I have my phone set to dark mode. I just find it easier uh, to read my phone in dark mode. So it automatically converts my background to black and my text to white. So this automatically converted for me, but this did not. And as you can see, there's a lot of black streaks in here. It almost looks like a, like one of those uh, redacted documents you see in a cartoon or a joke when you get a document from, from the FBI or something and you're trying to get all the details, but everything's been blacked out on you. No, that's actual text that's on here that was intended to be black text on a white background. And then you have the orange text on the white background as well. The problem is that this is not text. This was an image file that was created by the marketing and communications department and then embedded into this document below this introductory text. So this had a, a transparent background the image did. The colors of the fonts did not change when the background of my screen did. I can easily change this back and look at this in light mode instead of dark mode and I can see everything. But you can see what issues this might cause for a visually impaired user. First of all, they can't access this because the, the text itself is not machine readable. Second, there's the whole color contrast ratio issue. Simple little thing that it just, it, it had never been brought to the attention of the people who created this document uh, before they created it. And hopefully, raising awareness about these things, this will be avoided in the future. So it's very difficult to read that. You can also see here, here's an example of, uh, you know, this blue text looks like it's fine to read, but look at this here. That is very difficult to read on this screen. So you want to avoid using color to add emphasis uh, or to distinguish between bits of your text. Avoid highlighting things. Be cognizant of how your use of color is going to impact uh, different potential readers. And I'm going to show you a nice tool that I have that allows you to check this. It's called the Color Contrast Analyzer by the Pacciello Group. 
and I have a link to this in Canvas so you can download this for free and I do use this when I'm creating resources that I'm going to use more than once for my students I'll definitely bring this up like if I'm going to create an infographic that I'm going to repeatedly embed in a course I'll, I'll use this so I'm going to come back to this page here I've got my color contrast analyzer and I'm going to start with just the plain black text on the white background so I've got my foreground which is the uh, the text I'll find a little bit of the black text here and I'll pick my background Oh, I think I picked the wrong color for the text. I, I must have picked a bit of the shadow instead of the black. Hard to narrow in on that. There we go. So you can see my color ratio here is 5.3 to 1. Okay, it's not picking that up very well. Yeah, see, this is that's not the color I meant to pick up. I was trying to pick up the black. There we go. There we go, 21 to 1. So the black text on a white background gives you a 21 to 1 ratio, and it passes all the WCAG guidelines for, uh, for working with, uh, with color. Now if I were to take this blue text that I have down here, and I will take this yellowy background, now you can see the example of the text. You can see if it's only got a 1.4 to 1 color contrast ratio meaning that anyone who's got visual issues, they're going to find this far too difficult to read. So you want to make sure that this number here, this ratio number, is as high as possible. The easiest way to do that is black on white. And another little trick that I like to, uh, to show my students when we're looking at some of the tech tips is when you're editing your text, you have the option to pick your text color. Always, if it's available, always pick automatic. So I'll come in here into my Word document and show you what I mean. I've got this text here. I want to pick automatic. What's going to happen if I manually choose black or if I manually choose red? It's going to be hard coded as red. Some of our students may be using an application that will change the font color for them and change the font to something that is easier to read, say, if you have dyslexia or if you have some other uh, visual issue. Once we hard code something with a font and with a color, that often overrides some of these specialty applications that they use, and then they can't change the color, they can't change the size, and they can't change the font to something more readable for them. If you stick to automatic, then it's automatically going to change. Uh, for example, uh, if I switch to dark mode, it's automatically going to change the text to white. If I had this manually coded as black or red, it's going to keep it as red on a black background when I switch to, to dark mode or to high contrast mode. And it's going to cause issues for some of our readers. So little things that are easy to fix, but can be difficult to think of if, you, if it's never been brought to your attention before. So here we go. The link is down here at the bottom, Patch Yellow Group, Color Contrast Analyzer, if you'd like to download that tool and try it out yourself. So how are we doing on questions, Brad? Um, no questions at this time, Rob, but I, I do have a question for you. Um, sure. I'm curious. So we talked a lot about text documents and images. How would that show up in PowerPoint? Like, what are some things that we should know um, regarding digital accessibility when using PowerPoint? Good, good question. Yeah. I think we have a question from Robin. Go right ahead. Very curious, Rob, here. This, this is wonderful. Thank you. I know. Um, the, when you say a full Adobe suite was one of the questions I had before to check accessibility. I think that's a really important thing. Now, mm -hmm. Adobe suites pretty darn expensive. Is there a, a free checker or can I check it in Word? Because I tried in Word, it doesn't seem to be as good in terms of checking. You may be able to find uh, some good free PDF editing tools online. I think free PDF is one of them. I don't know how they handle uh, checking accessibility, but yeah. it might be worth doing that. But you know, if you don't have Adobe uh, Creative Cloud, you don't have the full Adobe suite, then you could get yourself an application like Google Read and Write, one of those other screen reader applications, and just test out the document. Okay, thanks. 
All right. Uh, the PowerPoint one is a very good question. Thank you uh, for bringing that up, Brad, because uh, this is something that I often forget about even when I'm creating PowerPoints as well. You have some of the same rules to keep in mind that you do for text documents. And I have, for example, a copy of, um, of the PowerPoint slide deck I'm using tonight here. And I've gone through and made this accessible all except for one page. One page of this is not accept, uh, accessible on it. I believe it might be this one. So I am going to check the accessibility on this one and show you what is wrong with it. So I think it's under review. Can be tucked away. Here we go. Check accessibility is under the review tab. Okay, so it does have some issues on this one. And one of these is the reading order. Now, oftentimes we might be building a PowerPoint and I might drag and drop a couple of these images in to begin with, then I'll add the heading in here. Or I might add this image first because uh, I had it handy in one folder and then I uh, I create one of these other images added in like this one and then I add this one in and then I go and I edit the text up here. PowerPoint tends to set the reading order as the order in which you added stuff to the slide. So I want this to be read first, but if I added this image first, it's going to put that first in the reading order. So here we go. Oh, I want to check my reading order on slide two is fine. Slide 10, slide 13. No, um, this one here, let's see the reading order. How do I check the reading order on this? Verify object order. Okay, I'm going to go back to that page here. Yeah, it's got the title first. Okay, that's good. It's got that one, that one, that one. So that's the correct reading order. Maybe it's this one. Yeah, this one is the one that's incorrect. So it's going to, it's going to read out this picture first and whether there's alt text on it, it'll read that first. This one's tagged as decorative, so it's going to skip it. That one's tagged as decorative. Then it's going to read the title and then it's going to skip this one. So the reading order is messed up here. I want it to read this first, then I have to take this and on my reading order pane here, just move that up first. Now I know it's going to read this first and then I want it to, uh, to pick up that one second and then this one third, then that one, then that one, and it's going to skip the decorative ones anyway. Now that's in the correct order and you want to do this for all of your slides. And a good clue for you, if you don't know where this reading order tab is, is to check your animations. If you have animations embedded uh, for when these things appear or disappear on your slide, the reading order tends to be the same as the animation order, which is the same order in which you added it to the page and you need to manually reorder it. So if I want to give a copy of this slide deck to my students to review later, I need to make sure I've checked all of these re, uh, the reading orders on all of the tabs. I need to make sure that I have alt text on all of my images or that I take them as decorative if, uh, if appropriate for that particular image. So in this example, you know, I might tag my logo here as, um, as decorative. But in this example, these wouldn't necessarily be decorative because they're making instructional points. So you just need to make that judgment call. And basically the same thing is working with a Word document. It just, it can take you a few extra steps in PowerPoint, but it is very much worth the effort. So how are we doing there now, Brad? Do we have uh, any other questions popping up or do we have time? I think we do to take a quick look at video. I'm not going to go into a full on demonstration because video is a whole huge can of worms working with video. Uh, I just want to make a couple of key points here. One is that, uh, just, before, yeah. just before you jump in, um, our friend Karen has a question and she says, is it fair to guess that the reading order in PowerPoint will carry over into Storyline? Ooh, that is a good question, Karen. I would assume that it does because from my experience working with Storyline, uh, it does suck in the structure of your slides. So it should carry over. Now there's other applications I've worked with where when you import PowerPoint into the application, it just flattens it. So there is no reading order to worry about. Okay. But storyline, storyline and Captivate are, uh, are big cans of worms themselves. And you definitely want to 
not make the assumption don't ever make the assumption that it carried over as you saw with uh, my example converting something from word to a pdf it doesn't necessarily carry over all of your accessibility features and you still need to check and and make sure that everything is uh, is working properly so when you bring it into a more advanced application like captivate or storyline yeah definitely check it inside that application as well and I would venture to guess that if you're working with Storyline or Captivate, then you're working with a commercial audience or a, a much bigger audience than you are if you're just producing this for your grade five students or your your one a one off resource for a group of high school students. And if you're producing at that level, then I think it behooves you to actually hire somebody to test your finished products for you. And that should be somebody who's actually living with one of those disabilities, not just somebody who knows a little bit about it. I often hear the phrase, uh, nothing about me without me. You want to include those who actually live the experience as part of your testing uh, once you get up to that kind of a level of production. Rob, what a great point. And uh, thanks so much for, for sharing that. Um, I just I just need some clarity on something, and maybe you, you showed this. So you showed us how to add alt tags to images in our text documents. Is mm -hmm. there anything else we should know about um, accessibility when working with images? Well, yeah, the, uh, the biggest point uh, is to make sure that you're not embedding a lot of text in images because it's not going to be machine readable. And the other point there would be that once you embed your image with instructional value to do as... Uh, as I was explaining in, uh, when I was answering Robin's question, make sure that you have multiple ways of attacking the content and presenting it to your students. So the image itself will be a focusing point. You have your alt text to describe what the image is about, but then provide uh, some kind of more easily machine readable, easily accessible means of getting at those key points. So describe it in paragraph form, in sentence form, as well as through the image. Those are some of the keys. Uh, and make sure that you're not using a lot of colors that are difficult to see in your images. Keep the contrast uh, as stark as possible so that it's easy to pick out everything that's in there. And then I think that that should cover you for most issues you're going to encounter when you're using images. Uh, you know, that's not even to look at copyright issues on images and stock images and things like that. That's, that's again, that's another whole other can of worms that's completely off topic for uh, for this webinar. Gotcha. And you, you did go through a lot of things that were very informative, but I just have to ask you something else. Um, you know, a lot of us work with web pages and learning management systems for delivering our courses. Do the skills you've demonstrated today carry over to those environments or, you know, what basic things could we be doing to make sure that we're doing um, doing our best work? Absolutely. They do. They do carry over. And uh Let's take a look at, uh, at an example here. So I'm going to uh, take a look at, I think I had it on my Color Essentials tab. I had it on one of these tabs. Yeah, so I've got some examples here of stuff that's not properly formatted on this page. And I'm going to edit this page here and show you how to fix that. So this here, I do have tagged as a heading three. Now, General rule of thumb when you're setting up content on a page, don't jump right down to, uh, to heading three or heading four. Heading one, the title, if you don't have heading one available here, that means the title of your page is heading level one. So your first heading here should actually be heading level two to help with the navigation structure. And your next heading level below that should be heading level three because it's a subheading. And maybe then I have another section down here which is going to be another example. I'll put this, this is not formatted at all. I'm going to put this as heading level three because it's a subheading of, of these here. This one here is heading level four. I just need to make sure I'm consistent with my headings. Again, this is the exact same stuff I'm doing with Word. With my images, I want to make sure that I've got my alt text in here. So you can see that there's an issue with this one. I haven't given it a proper uh, alt tag on here. It's just the file name of the image. Well, that's not good enough. That's not good enough for our users. Um, another example here, just the alt text is added and no, no proper description of this. I've got some color on here that's, that has poor contrast. So I'm going to change the color of this 
back to black. I'm going to remove this highlighter color here. Oh, I want to actually pick that as none. And it makes it much easier to read. Uh, so you can easily fix that stuff. If you're not sure if you caught everything, I've deliberately not addressed the uh, alt tags in these images. If you're not sure, then here in uh, Canvas and Moodle has similar features. So does uh, Brightspace Desire to Learn. Blackboard has some features built in. You can see there's a little accessibility checker icon down here, all tucked away. If I click on this, it's going to give me a report of issues that it finds on the page. So hopefully it uh, will pick all of these up here without too much delay. Seem to be having some issues going really slow. Okay, let's try that again. I'm going to just save this and come back into this page. It seems like it's, uh, oh, it seems like I might be having some connection issues with this is what the problem is. Hey folks, I am back. My apologies about that there. And I'm going to reshare my screen here now. Loud and clear, Rob. Perfect. And this happens. One of the things I like to tell, tell my students is that not to sweat it when this happens during your live classes because it's bound to happen from time to time. So, uh, okay, do I have the option to share my screen? I'm not seeing the screen sharing option on the bottom of my page anymore now, Brad. I'm only seeing the option to share this uh, slide deck. So I'm not sure uh, that I can actually show you more. Yeah, see if that, uh, if that helps. Make presenter, let's try that. There we go. Because I got out, kicked out and I came back in, I wasn't the presenter anymore. Awesome. Okay, so I am going to share my screen again. And where did we, uh, where did you lose the connection with me, Brad? What was I up to? I believe you were just starting your demonstration. Ah, uh, so you lost the whole demonstration on the, um, on checking the accessibility in the page. You still there? Yep, we got this part. Okay, so did you see me talking about the text and that in here? Yes. Okay. So did you see me? Uh, yeah, learning. You're on the LMS demonstration. Yes. So you saw me talking about how uh, when you uh, are working with the text, it's pretty much the same principles as working with a Word document. Uh, you want to make sure you set your proper heading structures uh, so that they're easy to navigate. Uh, don't manually format the text. You want to you wanna properly tag it as, uh, as uh, a heading structure. Make sure that okay. Make sure that you're using the um, the uh, black and white text as opposed to uh, to colored text uh, for emphasis. That's easy stuff to figure out. And then the next thing that I was uh, about to demonstrate, but it froze up on me as well, was the accessibility checker tool that's built in here in Canvas. And you have similar tools built into Moodle or in Brightspace or Blackboard or Virtually any uh, LMS platform now will have these tools built in. It's called an accessibility checker. So I've got this tool down here. I click on this and it's going to pick up the issues for me uh, that, that are in here. So one, it's picking up uh, alt text for this image and it's telling me what the alt text currently is and that it's not good enough. You shouldn't just have the file name in here. So I can easily fix that. And this is example of poor color ratio and apply that. So now it's not picking up any more accessibility issues in here. Uh, I often have my students author pages inside the LMS as part of group projects. And one of the first things I'll do after the due date, uh, I tell them in advance that they need to do this themselves, but I'll go in and I will run the accessibility checker and I'll pull the report. And then I'll list all of those issues for them in the feedback that I give them. and. Sometimes I'll give them uh, a little video showing them how to fix those things, but I, I try to show them those things up front 
And then they're responsible for making sure that it meets those just the same as they're responsible for making sure their papers meet APA formatting. They're also responsible for the digital accessibility on their pages. It's not going to pick up everything. Like it, it will pick up that there was uh, an issue with, uh, with that alt text. It's not going to pick up that this is text within an image. You still need to manually check some things. Automated systems are still not perfect for, uh, for checking all the potential accessibility issues. So yeah, a lot of these features do carry over nicely to an LMS as um, the same as they would with working with Word documents or with WordPress or any other web authoring platforms. A lot of the, a lot of those features um, do carry over. And I started to say a little while ago, I'm not going to go into a big detail about working, uh, a lot of detail about working with video here because there's a lot of ins and outs of learning how to use video. I mentioned earlier that uh, you should be making sure that your videos have captions on them. Um, and you can check that in, in uh, YouTube. So if I go to YouTube here and pull up one of my own videos, so I will go to um, our digital accessibility videos here. So I've got this one here using assistive technology to create an inclusive classroom. So I can, I can actually check uh, the closed captions on here, bring them up and play, and it will, it will ch uh, display the words for me. I'd want to listen to this entire video and make sure that the words match up with what's being spoken on the screen before I share it with my students. This is one that I didn't actually record. Somebody else recorded it and uploaded it, so I definitely need to do that. In my case, with a lot of the videos that I create, I'll create the captions file myself. So I'm confident of uh, what the captions are and I know that they match up. So just make sure that closed captions are available for your students and that somebody didn't just use the automatic, uh, automatic captioning feature because that may not translate properly when you're, uh, when you're sharing that with your students and might actually cause more confusion than if there were no captions at all. And if you want to learn more about adding closed captions using video editing software, I have a couple of videos in here. One is uh, from Screencast-O-Matic from that team showing how to add uh, captions with their editing suite. The other one shows you how to use the uh, YouTube video editor tools uh, when you upload your own videos to edit the captions that it automatically inserts and to add your own captions to it. Both of them very worth uh, exploring. And last week, Brad and I did a little bit of a demonstration because we knew that I wouldn't be able to actually bring up Screencast-O-Matic and show you how to add captions to a video because I'm using Screencast-O-Matic right now to record this webinar. Uh, so what we did was we did a little run through and I showed Brad how to use Screencast-O-Matic and add some captions to a test video that we were working on. And I've uploaded that video here uh, of the demonstration that Brad and I did. And I've made sure that this page is fully accessible to you. So there is a transcript file that you could download that I exported uh, as a PDF file. I created a PDF file of it. The captions are embedded in this video and it shows you how to create all of that. And I've also gone and put the, tr the entire transcript here on the page. So there's lots of ways when you're using something like Screencast-O-Matic that you can export and use the captions file that it can automatically generate for you based on your speech. And one of those is to put it right here on the page, or if you're using certain software applications, you can create like uh, on lynda.com or linkedinlearning.com, it's called now, those sort of tutorials where the uh, they have the scrolling text on the page underneath the video. You can export this and use it to create that. Uh, and then there's a PDF, which is fully accessible and machine readable, which can be downloaded as well. And I think that that's pretty much everything that I wanted to cover on here. Uh, I will put a, a video recording of this webinar session up on here for you. Um, I think I'll create a new module up at the top and, uh, or maybe I'll put it here, here under the webinar slides. I'll rename this and I'll add it in here. There's a copy of the slide deck that I worked with in here. And I'm going to upload that worked example of the uh, the Word document in here tomorrow as well for you. So all of that will be available tomorrow if you want to review anything. Uh, lots of good resources in here. If there's anything you'd like us to go into more detail on, 
Be sure to ask. We can probably find some more resources and add them in here for you. And I've set up some discussion forums in here where you can ask for questions or where you can share resources. Brad and I will be checking in here uh, throughout the month and we'll answer those questions for you. And maybe we'll get some questions from our January or our May 10th session as well. And we can add uh, those in here as well and address those. So a full month where we can uh, help each other out and share some ideas and some nice tips and tricks and resources to help us make sure we're doing just those simple everyday things to make all our resources as accessible as possible. Rob, I think I think we have a few minutes. You know, I know I know we're getting ready to wrap up, but I think there's a few minutes that we can uh, field some questions from absolutely, if any. absolutely. Hey, Rob. Go ahead, Robin. Uh, yeah, I may have a quote on my question. But um, <laughs> do you have any uh, suggestions? I'm just madly looking around for online courses on accessibility. And if I were looking for them, uh, I, I suppose I would have to target like something like there's going to be print and then there's going to be web and then there's going to be uh, video. Uh, does that make sense? Uh, I'm just. Yeah, I uh, I hear you. You're starting it's kind to cut of scrambling. out. There. I don't seem to see anything right now. Oh, uh, yeah, your your audio is cutting out there a bit. Hopefully, you can still hear me. Um, there are some programs that are out there uh, that offer some training in how to do some of this stuff. Um, but I was going to share with you, and I'll share my screen here right now again because I forgot to mention this. And this is embedded into our course site. So is this sharing my screen here now? Are you all seeing my screen? There we go. If you come to the modules area here in Canvas, yep, we're getting a bit of a leg. I have uh, a module here that's going to unlock tomorrow. I didn't want to, uh, to unlock it before we had a chance to speak, but there's a want to learn more. And I have a link here uh, to a free accessibility summer camp that I only discovered last week. It came through in my, uh, my Facebook feed. I'm part of an instructional designers group in there. This looks like it's going to be an awesome event. It's going to be for a full day in late June um, where they're going to have all kinds. It's almost going to be like a conference where they have all kinds of breakout sessions talking about different camps. So if you look at the program here, uh, they're going to look at uh, why accessibility is important, uh, faculty development on your campus, working with immigrant communities, document design, navigating the web with screen readers, accessibility testing for mobile devices, all kinds of stuff uh, that they have. And their keynote is uh, going to be from a gentleman from Google talking about how they're building inclusivity into their tools. So this looks like it's going to be fun. Uh, I am so there for this one. I'm going to sign up for it and spend the day checking out all of this because I am always keen to learn more and uh, might pick up some useful stuff here. But uh, I also think that this is something that should be built in more into the curriculum at uh, at the bachelor's of education and master's of education levels at different institutions. You know, we offer elective courses in some of our BED programs on integrating technology into education. I think we need to more explicitly address accessibility issues in all of the courses that we teach, not just in tech specific courses. We need to talk about how the resources that we use for gym class or for mathematics education might cause accessibility issues or how we can enhance accessibility when using those resources and in those contexts. I think it needs to be built in everywhere. I got one more question, Rob. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, when you're doing closed captions, do you advise, uh, because you can use what YouTube has done, it's about 80% accurate and you can go in and edit it. And I think you have some information on that. Would you advise putting a sort of black 
a line backward, uh, sort of on the background, uh, so that people can read it on a video. Like you could do that by editing afterwards. Is that a good practice, or? Uh, yeah, you you can certainly do that. If you were to use Screencast-O-Matic and add the captions, it will add that black line on there for you. If you export your MP4 uh, with the captions embedded. Oh. Okay. Thanks. I lost. I lost. Lost my audio there for a second. Yeah, you can you can certainly add uh, that stuff in in, in uh, Screencast-O-Matic automatically. It'll add the black banner to the bottom, of, and it will. Uh, it will put the captions on there. The problem with that is you can't turn them on and off. Um, and it will only be stuck in that one language. If I export the captions file from my video editor, upload that into YouTube, my users can turn them on and off, and then they can use YouTube's built-in features or other applications to automatically translate the captions for them. So if I just put the captions in a black bar in the bottom of my video, and I've got videos up there where I'm guilty of doing this, uh, then they can't be turned off. And uh, I've only discovered recently how to rectify that. So I'm constantly learning myself. And uh, I've learned that it's actually better if you don't automatically have the words on the bottom of the screen. You allow the user to toggle them on and off. And I've also learned that uh, that makes it easy to make multilingual versions of your videos for your students. So I was working for a client recently and they wanted to have... Uh, an English video, but then multilingual different indigenous languages, uh, captions for di different indigenous languages or a transcript at the bottom. So what we're doing is uh, sending off the English transcript to a native speaker of the different indigenous languages. They're coming up with their own script in their own language. And, uh, and it looks like I've lost my connection again. Can you hear me? Okay, ran into a problem there again. So I think you, uh, I think you get the point on that. Yeah, you can you can play around with that tool and you can add your own multilingual transcripts in there by using those uh, cl closed captions uh, tools. So, but I think the point you were making is just adding a black bar to the bottom to allow um, for space so that your your content is not uh, being blocked by the words and is easier to read the words. And uh, Brad, I think you might need to promote me to uh, to a presenter again because my connection cut and uh, and came back on. Um, similar to the two thirds rule with creating a good PowerPoint presentation, try not to put too much in the lower part of the screen. Anyway, keep your focal point in the center so that you don't have too much that's going to be drowned out by the words on the bottom. Anyway, um, but that that is a good idea. Just keep some white space or some black space or blank space near the bottom of your screen. Don't put too much content there and it's easier to read the words for sure. Now, how are we on questions? Thank you. Anybody else uh, have any questions they'd I think like that's to run? I for the uh, questions yeah. for this evening unless anybody else has one. I'm not hearing any, but we do have that discussion for questions, Rob. Well, I would like to say a heartfelt thank you to everyone uh, who came out here this evening uh, for your support, for both learning uh, some of the basics of digital accessibility, why it's important. I know that we didn't have time in just an hour or hour, 10 minutes or so to master everything. But at least your awareness is raised a little bit and you can go and find out more about this stuff and um, and start changing your practices a bit. So thank you for taking the time for that. Uh, but thank you also for uh, for uh, basically forking over the dough and supporting uh, supporting our efforts to support Jesse's journey. Um, I know that uh, the donations towards the 2021 virtual walk to defeat the Shen are going to be greatly appreciated by the organization. And they're certainly going to go towards a good cause with uh, some research and some treatment efforts that are dear to my heart. Because those of you who are participating tonight who have met me before, you do know that uh, I have a son who is living with the Shen and hence the connection with Jesse's journey. And hopefully uh, our, we're playing out a little bit tonight that's gonna make a big difference for him in the years to come. 
So thank you very much, everyone. And uh, I hope you have a great evening.